Um, all right, so again, this is how it ended last time. You looked at an um, evaluation of several transformer helix prediction methods and Burkhardt gave an outlook mentioning that um, there may be a possibility for some kind of improvement. That's the graph he showed. And here the blue method is TMSEC and that's exactly the method I'm going to talk about today. So, yeah, it's uh, not published yet, we just submitted it, but uh, hopefully it's going to be out soon and you can already use it today. I'm going to get to that in just a bit. So, first uh, thing you may ask yourself is we have so many prediction methods, why even bother making another one? So, at this point, there's like 50 of them at least. Everyone wants to have a part of the pie somehow. Um, but uh, nonetheless, um, there are several issues, um, some of which you've also seen last time. Uh, first of all, data for transmembrane proteins is very scarce because it's very hard to determine their 3D structure. And of course, if you wait a few years, then there's a good chance that some new proteins will have been solved. And once you have more unique proteins, then you have more training data. and you know, uh, you would expect that you can train a better predictor on this. Of course, you could also just retrain the models you already have. So if you've developed a transmembrane helix predictor, say 10 years ago, uh, you just give it a new data set, you train it again, and that should also pre improve that predictor. However, no one seems to be doing that for some reason. Um, so everyone always develops a new method instead. Plus, from our lab, there is uh, only one really, really old method, and for us it actually makes sense to predict something that uses more recent machine learning models and uh, is a bit more up-to-date. The second part is that, um, I'm not sure how much this was covered, but many of um, the, the methods that were evaluated last time are relatively sophisticated in their machine learning. So they have a really high number of free parameters and um, given how little data we have, we actually kind of want to avoid that as much as possible because we could potentially overtrain the method. And also to get to the third point because it simply means that the method is going to have a very high runtime and that's also not desirable. So for something like Polyphobus, for example, that is relatively fast. It can predict a few sequences per minute, but some methods like MEMZSVM in particular, for example, is really slow. It's, I believe it has like not even half a sequence per minute it can predict. That's fine if you only have 10 proteins you're interested in, but if you want to predict the whole proteome, then this can become an issue. So we want to predict a new method. Um, and first of all, for that, we of course need to collect the data set. Uh, again, you've heard about the evaluation paper last time. The protocol to collect the data set here is almost exactly the same. So first of all, we need a data set of um, proteins for which you have a high resolution 3D structure where we can see the membrane helices. And um, there's two databases that annotate helices from 3D structure. They're called OPM and PDBTM. And uh, the assignments of the helices from these structures differ because even if you have the 3D structure, nothing tells you exactly here is the membrane. For example, also because the membrane is not part of the structure, so you cannot crystallize the protein in the membrane, so you don't know exactly where the membrane actually is. And that's why um, there are algorithms that from the structure try to determine where most likely the membrane is situated. And the results of these algorithms from OPM, PDM, PDM, PDM simply differ. And we don't really know which one is true, same as last time. So what we have to do is we, we simply have to use both of them and assume that they are both in some way correct. Um, yeah, and also, again, the annotation is then on the atomic coordinates. So we have in the PDB 3D structures, we see uh, for every atom where it is situated and from the atoms uh, of the amino acid residues that we have resolved, we can infer a certain sequence. But that sequence is um, what was determined in the experiment. That doesn't necessarily mean that this is the sequence that would appear in reality. Because, um, for example, the experimentalists for determining the structure may have changed some residues, so it crystallizes easier, or they may have crystallized only a fragment, or things like that. So what we would actually rather want is um, the actual protein, how we believe it appears in the body. So what we do to, do that, to get to that point, and that is also the same as in the last paper, um, I just realized the bottom part is missing, but I can't change this. So sorry about that. Uh, or can I get this down even further? 
Ah, I can. Okay. So same as last time, what we do is we use sifts and we um, map the sequence from the atom coordinates in the PDB to the sequence in Uniprot, which we believe is a um, more realistic case of what you would expect as an input to such a method. Um, and then finally, of course, to avoid biases in our training and evaluation, we have to perform a redundancy reduction, and for that we use unique prot, which uses the HSSP value and that curve you've already seen before as well. Okay, and um, finally, something that the evaluation paper did not um, cover. So for membrane proteins, you often also want to predict the topology. So which loops are on which side of the membrane? Are they on the extracellular side or on the cytoplasmic side, essentially? And um, to do that, in PDBTM, there is now an annotation for it, but when this data set was built, it did not exist yet. Uh, so what he did instead is um, he used the OPM annotation, so that's uh, the visualization of a structure, how you can download it from OPM. And as you can see, they just put atoms here where the algorithm believes um, that the membrane slab, that the membrane borders are, and then on the website there's an annotation, the end terminus we believe is, for example, uh, extracellular, and then from that um, you know, okay, I start at the end terminus, let's assume that's down here, I don't know actually. Um, so, this, so here's an open end, here's an open end, here's an open end, evidently there's some fragmentation going on, or, or it's because, yeah, it's actually for different uh, um, it's multiple chains next to each other. Anyway, um, we have the annotation of what the end terminus is and then we just um, follow along the structure. We look at the 3D coordinates and uh, that way we can tell um, which part, uh, which side of the membrane um, a loop residue like all of these down here and all of these down here are at because that functionally is very important to know so we would want to predict not only what are the helices here but we also want to know on which side are the parts that are not the helices and yeah the annotation from OPM um, is that's how we get it from OPM uh, okay so next uh, we also need a data set that has uh, signal peptides and you also know already why that is important Signal peptides look a lot in some way like transformed helices. They have a core hydrophobic region, and if you don't, do not account for this, then it can easily happen that you mistake one for the other. And we don't want that, of course. So um, what we used here is, um, is a data set from Signal P4. Signal P4 is a method that predicts signal peptides, but they have the same issue from the other side, so they do not want to predict transmembrane proteins uh, as false positives. So they built a set of proteins that uh, do not have a signal peptide or a transmembrane helix that have signal peptides and that have signal peptides and transmembrane helices. And uh, we just used the set. We first of all, uh, again, did redundancy reduction against uh, the set of 166 transmembrane proteins we found before, and um, then also did a redundancy reduction within the actual set, um, yeah, again, to avoid any biases. And what that gives us is uh, 1,142 proteins that have neither signal peptide, uh, that have some of which have signal peptides, so 452 of those have signal peptides, the rest has neither signal peptides nor transmembrane helices. Um, and then there's a set of uh, transmembrane proteins of which 25 additionally to the helices have uh, signal peptides. And that whole set combined is this SP1441 set, um, which we have in addition to the set of 166 transmembrane proteins. And again, both of these have been redundancy reduced within each other, but also to each other. So there's no redundancy with, between any of these sets. Uh, right, so then once we have the sets, um, we want to perform a cross-validation that we've also heard before, I'm sure. So what we're doing is we just split every set into four pieces um, and we try to maintain the distributions um, as much as possible. So for example, how many helices are in every split set or how many signal peptides do we have and how long are the sequences in every set. So we try to get these four, four subsets as um, comparable as possible and then uh, three of those we assign to uh, we assign to the training and the fourth one we, we we term a blind set and we never look at again until at the very end what's that 
Uh, okay, so then we have our three sets, and on those we're going to perform the training in the following. Um, since then, I believe has not mentioned, not been mentioned yet before. Um, really quickly, we're going to look at random forests, and to understand random forests, we need to know what trees are. Since you are the computer scientist, you probably already know this anyway, but it's going to be short. So, um, what is a classification tree? You have a set of input samples, like for any um, classifier, and a certain set of input features, and you want to find a recursive partitioning of these features to predict your labels, which are in the leaf nodes in this case. And how to exactly do that? There's many different algorithms, how to prune the tree, how to perform a split at every tree node and so on, but we're not going to look at any of this. Basically, this is what it looks like. So we have a classification tree here. The labels are in the leaf nodes. So we have uh, three different classes, uh, which are colored. And we have two features, x1 and x2. And now um, we want uh, to build a tree that predicts from these features what class the label belongs to. And um, to do that, we go to the root node and then some algorithm, again, doesn't matter here, um, decides, okay, um, x2 is to, performs the best partitioning between our classes that we have. So we split the two and we split the tree at x2 at a threshold of x2 um, equals 0.7. And that's visualized here at the left. So we have x2 on the y-axis, and we just uh, partition our, our space at um, 0.7. And uh, then in those two sub-partitions, we do the same thing again. We check um, what, for example, here, what is the best partitioning between 2 and 3. Uh, and in this case, this is x1 equals minus 1.4, uh, which would be the part down here. Right, yeah. Um, and then you can see here, since this is um, also plotted in here, that most of the two labels are now here and most of the three labels are now here. And uh, we do the same thing again on the other side and here a different threshold is better. Uh, so it's a bit more at the right. But this is essentially what it's doing. That's what I mean by a recursive partitioning of the feature space. We just start with something and then we go down the tree and try to divide as best as possible between the class labels. Now, this is not necessarily optimal, but um, for, I mean, this is a simple example. For two features, we could find an optimal example by simply trying out every possibility. But um, for realistic applications, um, that is not really feasible most of the time. So we, um, yeah, so that's, that's a good enough approximation usually. Um, right, so that's what classification trees are. Now TMSEC is using random forests. Um, random forests is an ensemble method that uses trees as its weak learner. So you have uh, not one tree, but a set of trees. And um, you again have the same set of input features, but uh, now for every, for every tree you build, you choose one subset of features that you use, and then um, you uh, also do a subsampling of your training samples for every tree, and then build that tree based on these subsamples, and um, then build many trees. And uh, the whole, uh, so the output of every tree is then what your final result is. And um, that, why, why is that, uh, why do we care about that? So. First of all, trees are really fast, and using random forests, okay, we have many trees, but it's still really fast. Um, at the same time, we have uh, much better accuracy than we would get from a single tree. We maintain that it's not a black box, so not something like a neural network, which gives you an output, but you have no idea really where that thing comes from, because I mean, you can look at the, the weights of the nodes, but that doesn't tell you anything. A tree splits at a certain feature, so you can interpret it much easier. Um, and yeah, so that's I already said. Finally, rainforest just um, generally actually have a really good performance and also for us uh, turned out to be the best performing model. And um, as you can see here on the right, so this is uh, just uh, uh, literature, literature mining of uh, mentions of different machine learning models. Uh, random forests are pretty new, so they are all the way down here. But um, since their introduction, they've actually gained a lot in popularity. Uh, we would expect them to go even higher here, so this ended in 2010 already. 
while, um, for example, neural networks were going down a bit in popularity, but then again, that was maybe a bit before deep learning, so uh, these could now also go up again. But anyway, it's a relatively new method, but it's um, becoming very popular. So, um, what do we use the random forest for? TMSEC is, um, yes? Uh, for the last slide, is there a difference between fast and good performance? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so, so, sorry, fast meant runtime, good performance meant uh, good evaluation performance, so good accuracy, for example. Maybe I could have worded that a bit better, yeah. <laughs> um, so having both is what we want, right? Uh, we can always have something that has good accuracy, but which runs for days, that doesn't help us very much. Um, okay, so TMSEC has uh, different different steps, and the first step uh, predicts the, the location of the transparent helices. And to do that, we use a random forest. The random forest consists of 100 trees, and we use a subset of nine features uh, in, in every tree building, and a sliding window of 19, uh, which was chosen during the cross-validation as, uh, as the best value. And we get three scores out of that um, tree. So we get a score for a signal peptide, we get a score for transforming helix, and we get a score for soluble. So for every residue in the middle of the sliding window that we look at, we predict is it a signal peptide, a helix, or a soluble, um, a soluble residue in either of the two. And um, just in terms of uh, calculation performance now, um, we also scale the scores to integers because it's faster. So we don't need more accuracy than these um, four digits here from 0 to 1000 and we use those instead of the floating points uh, from 0, 0 to 1.0. Okay, so the result looks something like that. Just to make that clear again, down here we have every residue in our sequence and for every residue uh, we calculate the three scores. And um, yeah, for example, here at the beginning, you can see the signal peptide scores are relatively high. So this protein is probably has a signal peptide at the start. And then uh, in the rest of the sequence, you see alternating, uh, alternating scores for, for non-transmembrane and transmembrane. So that's the first raw output that we get. Then in the next step, or no, not in the next step, sorry. First of all, to the features again. Um, so, the actual features that we use um, are a few global features like the amino acid composition and uh, the protein length, but there's also several local features. There's a PSSM score, which I think you've talked about before what a PSSM is, um, so this uh, takes care of the, the conservation, which is a really important feature usually. We look at the distance to the N and C terminus, which for transmembrane proteins is an interesting statistic. And then, of course, we have uh, hydrophobicity, which you know is really important for transmembrane proteins, and also charge, which is, which is important because, for example, within uh, membrane helix, you do not expect to have any um, strong charges. And the same thing essentially goes for polarity. And uh, some of these we only use in a window of nine, simply because if you use a window of size 19, the signal be became too, too muddled and the, the predictor couldn't really capture the signal anymore. Um, so we have all of these features. Uh, one more peculiarity is, so we do have the PSSM score as a feature in itself that does give the predictor some kind of knowledge about the conservation, but we wanted to model it even more explicitly on top of that. So um, what uh, we did here is, um, this is our PSSM, so our sequence of interest uh, runs down here. And then for every amino acid at every position, we have a certain conservation score. And um, for this example, we're going to assume that our sequence actually only has five residues. Um, of course, usually it goes much further down. So what we do then from the PSSM, we simply look how many positions have a score that's uh, bigger than zero that are conserved and uh, how many have a score smaller than zero that are not conserved. And uh, we actually ignore the ones that have zero because in the, in this model, um, zero is assumed to be the background. So it's neither nor, so we simply leave those out completely and we count the other two. So once we have that, um, some of the features we now split up into um, conserved or non-conserved. Uh, for example, here for the amino acid composition for methionine, 
We look um, all positions where methionine has a PSSM score bigger than one. So we just look at this column for methionine and we count how often do we have here um, a green number in this case and there's only one. And we had 16 in total and now a PSSM. So the, this uh, feature is then one out of 16 is our, um, yeah, our amino acid composition for conserved methionines. And the same thing we can do for the non-conserved part. Again, we do not look at the zero. So um, what we have is uh, three out of uh, the whole 79, which are red, are uh, non-conserved. That's clear, right? Okay, and the same thing again. For example, if we wanted to look at percent positive charge, um, positively charged residues in our definition are arginine and lysine, so R and K. And uh, we do the same thing over those columns again. We count the number of um, green positions, and so there's one down here and one up here. Uh, here, sorry. <laughs> so two out of 16 are conserved, and the others are non-conserved. And that we do not for all features, but for all features which um, I marked here with PSSM smaller or bigger than zero. Um, so. These here are the final number of features and uh, as you can see some of them we simply have twice because we look at them not uh, over the whole sequence but split up into conserved and non-conserved parts. Excuse me? Yes. Can you go one slide um, and, yes. and explain why you just say 2 out of 16? Mm -hmm. and there are a lot of more Yes, yes, sorry. So again, positive charge means the, the amino acid is positively charged, first of all. And that's two amino acids. So arginine and lysine are positively charged amino acids. And now for those, we want to know um, how many of those do we have conserved, right? So we look at the column for arginine and we look at the column for lysine. And in those columns, we now check how many values are bigger than zero. And that's two. And smaller than zero are eight. Make sense now? Okay. Uh, yeah, right. And again, these are the, this is the final set of features that the first step is using. Okay, now the second step of the method is an um, empirical filter, which simply um, smooths out the result a bit. You have seen something similar before, I believe, for. Um, Sec, which predicts secondary structure and um, the idea was the same so there was an output of a neural network and then you feed it into a neural network again which then kind of smooths out the segments and this is the same idea here just we're not using a neural network to do it or a different machine learner but simply some uh, empirical rules and uh, in this case that's a median filter uh, a median filter not a mean filter because um, a median keeps the, um, the distinction the same. So if something switches over from a very high score to a very low score, if you use the mean of that, then you, you essentially kill this clear distinction. If you use the median, it still is maintained. Um, yeah, so that's one thing and we're going to look at an example about in the next slide. Um, but apart from that, we also reduce some of the scores simply due to the data set being a bit biased and we want to avoid that they are over predicted. So we have many, um, many negative, uh, many more negative um, labels than positive ones. So we reduce those. And um, actually, compared to the sigma peptides, we also have more helix uh, labels, so they are also a bit reduced. And again, none of this is learned. These are just empirically chosen values um, because during the cross validation, those gave the best performance. Um, yeah, and then finally, we, we reduce um, senseless predictions, essentially. So signal peptides that are shorter than four residues are just not biologically possible. And uh, the same way, we do not expect any transmembrane helix to have less than seven residues. So they are simply um, removed, as in they are relabeled to soluble residues instead. Uh, okay, so the median filter. Uh, just to look at example of what we mean, uh, here we have uh, the scores for signal peptide soluble and transmembrane helix, so the three output scores of the first step. Up here is our sequence, and if we look, for example, at this residue, 
I said we use a window of five, so we look at this residue and the two here and the two here, and we apply a median to that, and then um, the median of those five values is 600, so this now becomes 600, what used to be 800. Pretty simple, right? And I'm not sure if the others line up, so don't, don't only look at the colored part. <laughs> the, the, this is not a real example, but something we constructed. Um, yeah, so uh, then here we have 600 um, as our value instead, and um, we do the same thing for all of the other residues as well. We just slide the window over, and then finally we do the, um, the reduction of the scores, as I've mentioned before. So, for example, the soluble ones, you can see um, we all subtract by values. Some of them even become negative here. Um, so, this is very likely not a signal pep uh, soluble residue. Um, yeah, and then among the final three scores, you can see here we see that the highest is always the one for signal peptides. So, the final label we would predict here at this point would be signal peptide. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so you put the median footage just on the A, on the R median. Uh, in this example, we, we look at the median filter for A, yeah. So the, mid, the, the center residue is the A. Uh, is it really A? Yeah. So here, this is the center, and we look at the, two, at the two residues around it and the center one, and what's highlighted in uh, green is the median of those. And that is what then becomes assigned to the center residue instead of the original score. Okay, and what happens to the others? That, there we do exactly the same thing. So then we, next we take, uh, say, this one as the center residue, we look at the two around it, and we again assign the median to it. Okay, so then the second step uh, you illustrated here, you did um, several steps in one, or just... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this assumes that we did the median over every single score already, yeah. Yeah, the same thing down here, so, yeah. Okay, um, so that's the second step. Again, there's no machine learning involved here. That's just empirical filters and rules. Um, this is the overview again. We had this prediction before, and now we, um, we use these empirical filters, and we, uh, in the end, after all of those, we assign the final prediction to what is the highest score. So currently, um, we believe that this is signal peptide. I mean, we can see the score is really high here. Then here's a transmembrane helix, which is pretty clear. And then here we seem to have a really long transmembrane helix. So that's, um, that's the result at the end of step two. In the third step, we do perform machine learning again. Uh, that uh, is a neural network now that tries to refine the prediction of um, where the helices are. And uh, to do that, we use a relatively small neural network, just uh, 25 nodes, 25 hidden nodes. And what this gets as an input now is not, um, not the whole sequence or window of the sequence, but the input is now the different segments. So maybe I should go back again. The input is now the sequence from here to here, for example, or from here to here. So only the things that we have predicted as a transmembrane helix, we now look at as an input segment. And that means that we also need to uh, use features that we can calculate uh, that we can calculate for for segments, not for a sliding window over a sequence. Um, so the features that we have left are um, again the amino acid composition, the hydrophobicity, the charge, and we also use um, the actual length of the segment as an input. And um, sorry about the misalignment. So this is these first four. We all distinguish again by um, uh, conservation being higher or, or smaller, uh, being conserved or unconserved. Uh, and that gives us a set of uh, input features um, to the neural network. And then, yeah, the output of the neural network is um, uh, an adjustment of that, of that helix segment. And so, yeah. Uh, again, what we also do here is we look at very long helices. So we saw in the prediction before we had a helix that was particularly long. 
um, and we evaluate whether we should split it up into two helices instead. So it's possible that um, there's a helix and then there's a really short loop and then immediately helix again. It could be that the predictor does not capture this really small loop signal in between and simply sees that there's lots of hydrophobicity pretty much in a long stretch and then predicts one long helix. Um, but this would be wrong. On the other hand, it's not that we simply categorically always split long helices because uh, long helices are also something that can appear. So um, if, for example, um, you think about helices that are tilted in the membrane, um, then they can, of course, be a lot longer than a helix that is exactly perpendicular to the membrane. And tilted helices are something that uh, exists. So we evaluate both cases, and whatever gives the higher score is what wins in the end. Um, and at the same time, also the endpoints can be same thing. So we look if we shift the helix a bit to the right or to the left, or if we adjust the end a little bit, does that give us a better score? Um, that's in a way also paying tribute to the fact that our that the annotations are not 100% exact and that OPM and PDBTM do have a shift between the annotations that is on a similar level. So uh, again, you do not know exactly where the helix begins or ends. And here we simply look if maybe uh, yeah, tuning these a bit improves the performance. So that's then what the result looks like after the third step. Um, the only thing that we can see here now in this overview that changed is that first of all we split up this helix, it's now two helices, which apparently gave a better score. And you can also see that um, the endpoints actually are a bit different. So this one goes further to the right, this one goes a bit further to the left. And then in between now of course we also have soluble residues because we split up the helices. Okay, and then finally, we have a random forest predictor again, um, because now we know, okay, where are the soluble residues, where are signal peptides, if they are in the sequence, and where are the helices, um, but we still have to predict the topology. So we want to know which of the soluble parts are on which side of the membrane. And to do that, we have again a random forest of 100 trees, um, who uses only seven features. Um, again, that's simply the result of the cross-validation. Um, and all this does is it assigns the, the soluble segments to either of the two sides of the membrane. And um, so maybe let's check here again. Um, so if this is side one, then this is side two, then this is side one, then this is side two. We simply assign like that. We don't know yet which side is inside or outside, but we can call them side one and two because we know that after every helix, the side is going to switch. Um, and then for both sides, we calculate a set of features. Um, and we also calculate them based on whether they're conserved or not. So uh, for the positive charge, for example, now we the pos percent positive charge is only one value, but we calculate it conserved, non-conserved, so we actually have two values. And we can calculate it for side one, side two, so we actually have four values. That's why we have two times two for all of these. Um, yeah, and then again from that, the, the output is where is the end terminus uh, situated? So is the end terminus inside or outside? Because once we know that, we assume that after, FD, after, after every helix, um, the, the, every helix crosses the membrane, after every helix the side changes, so then we can simply extrapolate the whole thing. But yeah, I actually have a slide for that. Um, yes, what I forgot to mention is we, we look at not, so we look at not only the soluble part, we also look a little bit inside into the helix. So eight residues inside the transforming helix are still considered for this calculation. Uh, again, because there is no clear cut way where the soluble part exactly ends. And at the same time, we also don't look at the full soluble loops, but only at uh, 15 residues because uh, soluble parts can be really large, hundreds of residues potentially, and then that soluble part may be a completely different domain that has its own function and all and that, of course, we do not want to model here. So we only want to look at the basic signal, is it inside or outside the membrane, and for that, the, the residues close to the membrane and a bit inside of the membrane are exactly what tell us that information. 
Um, if we do predict a signal peptide, then we simply predict um, anything that follows the signal peptide is outside because that's what it usually is. And otherwise we use, again, whatever the output is, um, whatever we believe is the end terminus, um, and from that we extrapolate the size. So that's then the final result. Um, here we did predict the signal peptide, so we infer that anything that follows the signal peptide before the first helix is outside, so extracellular. Then comes the helix, uh, and afterwards necessarily it has to be inside, and that way we just switch over between the two. And the charge um, is also highlighted here, so that, as I said, is one of the input features, and you've heard about the positive inside rule. Usually the inside loops have more positive charges than the outside loops. Uh, we don't explicitly use that rule, so it's not like we, that we say, um, we calculate this and then we say where there's more positive, um, this is inside, but we use it as an input feature, as one of the input features. Okay, so now we have our final predictor. We want to know how it performs. Um, again, repetition, you've heard before that per-residue scores are not particularly good for transmembrane helices uh, especially because they um, don't, so first of all, all methods seem to perform more or less the same, but um, it doesn't at all model something where you would have uh, predicted helix and then in the middle of the helix there's one or two soluble residues predicted. That makes no sense biologically, but on a per residue score you would not see this signal because it's just two residues of hundreds and relatively it would still be pretty good, but it doesn't make any sense. So what we use instead is we look, uh, we look at segments and in particular we look at how many segments in a whole protein are predicted correctly. And, uh, the reasoning for that is um, that if you get one segment wrong, then you usually get the topology wrong because, you know, you miss the helix, then you suddenly believe that outside is actually inside. And for the function of transforming proteins, this is really important. So what we would actually want is that we get every helix correctly. And that's what the, the whole protein scores are modeling. And uh, QOK, you've also seen before, we look at the at the segments, at the predicted helices, um, and for those calculate the recall and uh, the, the precision. So, yeah, sorry, um, we calculate recall and precision over the segments and um, then we simply check is for this protein uh, both recall and precision 100%. So what this means is we predicted every helix and replaced it at the correct position. Um, for every helix in this protein. And then we calculate that for every protein and then we get a percentage value for how many proteins were we correct. To do that, we need to know what is a correctly predicted transformin helix. So we're looking at uh, something where we have uh, an annotation for a helix that is predicted and we have some kind of prediction for a helix. And I mean, we could say, okay, only if it's 100% match and it's correct. But that is uh, not very realistic, again, because even the experiments are not that accurate. There is some deviation. So what we do instead, and this you've also seen before, I believe, that's exactly the same scoring as in the evaluation paper. <coughs> we check that the endpoints between the helices do not differ than more than five residues. And compared to what was done before, that actually is relatively strict. So usually people just check, hey, uh, if you have three years of residues overlap, then it's fine. But then you could have something like this, which makes no sense really, and it would still be considered correct. So what we want is that the both helices overlap at least by 50% and that the endpoints do not deviate more than five residues. And that does allow some variation between the two, but they have to be pretty correct. And the variation, again, may be biological truth because they do wobble a bit in the membrane because there is no clear distinction. And at the same time, it also accounts for the fact that we don't know anymore exactly. So QOK, again, you've seen before. Um, now that we have topology, so the evaluation paper did not look at all at topology, but now we also have topology, so we can just extend our QOK score. 
by topology. And this is uh, exactly the same thing as you've seen before, only that besides precision and recall being 100%, we also want the topology to be correct. And uh, topology 100% correct, again, um, if, if the QOK is one, then we know we found every helix. So all that we need for topology being correct is that the N terminus is correctly placed. Because then necessarily, because we know the helices are correct, everything else is going to be, is going to be correct as well. <coughs> Um, yeah, and this is the same. So this is exactly like QOK, just in addition, the topology also has to be correct, not just the placement of the helices. And uh, this is the result. So that's um, what Professor Rost essentially teased last time. Um, if first of all, if we look at only the correct placement uh, of the helices at the QOK, we can see that uh, TMSEC is um, the highest performer. Although, since this is transfermian helix prediction and the usual problem of small data sets, if we do uh, take into account the error bars, which we have to, of course, um, then we can't really say that it's significantly better than any of the other methods. So there's some trend, but um, we can't claim we are definitely better. Uh, if we look at QTOP, we can actually do this. So um, not for all methods, but we do see that um, for predicting helices and topology, for example, TMSEC is better than polyphobius, and also generally it's achieving the, the highest score again between these methods. Um, oh, and what I didn't mention yet, so why these methods, in case you don't remember, so MEMSET, SBM, polyphobius um, are the ones that we determined are essentially the best ones in the evaluation we performed before. Um, and MEMSET3 is particularly good on predicting topology, so that's why we put this one at, in as well. Right, so we know uh, how we perform for predicting transfermian helices and the topology, but um, these predictors, for example, can be applied to whole proteomes. So they also have to be able to, first of all, identify what even is a transmembrane protein and what is a soluble protein. And that's what we're measuring here. So we simply have um, the false positive rate, so the over prediction, if you will, of transmembrane proteins and the sensitivity. So how many of the proteins that are real do we actually predict as such? How many do we capture? And um, we compare this now to a baseline predictor, which is going to appear in the next plot. And this baseline predictor is um, just to have an idea of what, what you can actually get by just using the absolute, the most basic possible um, prediction that you could imagine without using any fancy machine learning. So this baseline predictor is really just the height of viscosity scale in a sliding window. And as soon as um, the uh, total height of viscosity in the window gets over a cutoff of four, we predict that whole thing to be a transformian helix and we move on to the next part. So this is the most stupid predictor that you could possibly imagine just to get an idea of whether we're actually doing any sense, uh, anything sensible in our uh, machine learning or if you're just overfitting the problem and not gaining anything over what you can get simply from looking at hydrophobicity. So that's the result. Um, and as you can see, uh, in sensitivity, pretty much all, um, all predictors are performing really well. Even the baseline predictor already reaches 95%. Um, so there's not a whole lot to improve upon. But all methods do well, and if we take into account the error, we can't really distinguish anything here. So everyone's doing good. If we look at the, if we look at the false positive rate, um, we do see something interesting. So first of all, baseline is performing really bad. and um, that is um, most likely because, again, anything that looks even a bit hydrophobic is predicted as a helix by this um, predictor. So we would expect this to not perform too well here. But also the two machine learners, MEMSET uh, SVM and MEMSET 3, actually do not perform that well, while both TM and polyphobus are pretty good at, whoops, sorry at predicting only those um, proteins as transmembrane that actually are transmembrane. Um, and we can also see that uh, for, most, for most of these, uh, TMSEC also gets the topology correct, while polyphobus, for example, performs uh, significantly worse here. 
So if we take all of these scores into uh, account, um, essentially TMSEC is the best method because from all of these it, um, uh, it gets the best trade-off over all of these compared to the other methods. Um, and just to give you an idea again of what this actually would mean in a real example, so for example, say we want to predict um, the human proteome, how many transforming proteins are in there, and um, TMSEC would get the lowest number of um, false specifications in there, while for the other methods it's significantly higher. Okay, so now we did all of this and uh, this took a few years and again we, we always have very little data for transmembrane proteins so we want to do all we can to get more data. Uh, we can't continuously update our data set that also wouldn't really help us but now we've performed the method, the method is done um, and in this case this took almost, well it took two and a half years more or less since we started collecting the data set. Uh, so we can check what happened in the meantime. Uh, did any new transmembrane proteins get published? And uh, in this case, 12 new structures came out, um, which <laughs> is also very little, unfortunately, but this is not going to change anytime soon. So um, inferring, uh, so if we look, although this is a really small data set, if we look at it, we can see that um, of the 12 proteins, 10 TMSEC recognizes, which is all right. Ideally, of course, we would want it to recognize all of them, but of the ones it recognizes, it actually predicts everything correctly. So the, all of the helices are correctly placed, the topology is also at a really high level. So while we can't say too much because the errors are huge in such a small data set, of course, it does look like it's actually performing really well, which is nice. Question? No. Okay, and finally, um, if you remember, TMSEC has these uh, filter steps. So step three and step four um, are doing something that is not necessarily specific to TMSEC. So what it does, it takes the transformed helix prediction in step three and it tries to improve it by slightly changing it. And in step four, we uh, simply we get what is already predicted as um, where the transformed helices are already predicted and we check if we can improve the topology of it. And this we can apply not just to the output of the first two steps of TMSEC, we can also do that for any other method that already exists. So we checked if maybe we can this way improve the methods that are already published. And um, again we did this for the three methods that we know are best. Um, and as you can see for polyphobius, for, so let's look at the QK first for polyphobius uh, and also for MEMSA SVM. Uh, there is little improvement, um, but in particular for MEMSA 3, which may be kind of expected because it's the, old, the relatively old method, um, we do see that just using our two filters on the already final prediction from MEMSA 3, we can actually quite significantly improve that performance of the predictor and also for the baseline predictor. Even more so for uh, when we take into account the, the topology, um, apparently this last, this fourth step is doing really well in, um, yeah, in predicting topology and is improving all of these predictors actually. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, this is also a really nice result that we not only have, um, <coughs> sorry, that we have a new method that performs really well, but um, it's so modular that we can use some of its features to actually also apply it to what's already out there and also improve those methods. Okay, and finally, one thing that TMSEC does not do at all, which would be nice if it didn't. Um, I'm not sure if reentrant helices have ever been mentioned before. So these are two of them. In yellow, we are, you have usual transmembrane helix. Um, and then there's one side in blue, one side in red. And the, the yellow helices cross from one side to the other side. Sometimes there is something like these orange reentrant helices which starts on the blue side here, goes into the membrane about halfway and then turns around again and exits on the blue side. So these do not cross the membrane, they kind of dip into it but then exit on the same side again. 
that is not extremely common, but they do appear. And I, so if you have one of these in your set, then of course you are gonna have big problems predicting them, A, because they look different, so they're shorter, typically they can be shorter, and they're also going to mess up your topology prediction. Because in our topology prediction, we assume that every helix crosses the membrane. But if you have one of those in between, and say you predict it, but then you, then you assume that this part, where it comes back here to the blue side, would actually be the red side. And then everything, then the whole topology from that point on will be wrong. So this is of course something that we would want to capture. The problem is that there is very little data. So we have our transmembrane proteins, which are already, already very few, and then only few of those have reentrant regions. So I don't remember the exact number. I, I believe it was around 15 reentrant segments that we have. And training a predictor on that is not really sensible. So we really would want to have this, but currently we do not see how yet. Um, and the, the only thing we can do at this point is wait for more data and hope then that at some point we can model those as well. Um, and the idea would then be to, for example, look at transmembrane helices in the refinement step that seems strange, that maybe have borderline scores which are not that high, which are maybe really short. Um, and then look if we change this prediction to um, what the reentrant helix would be, if that would improve our overall score. But again, currently we do not have the data for this. Okay, finally, um, the method is available in several ways. Um, not so you are a computer scientist, you know this anyway, but um, availability is important uh, because no one, this is no point, there's no point in developing a method if no one can use it. Uh, so. Unfortunately, it's not that uncommon that, well, well, it used to be, nowadays it's better, but uh, you can, could get things published without really making them available to anyone, and the question is, what's the whole point? Um, so not only do you have to develop your method, you have to make sure people can also use it. And in this case, we have a Debian repository uh, on Rostlab where TMSEC is available. It's also on GitHub with all of the source code, of course. And then there's this, big web server predict protein which incorporates all of our methods and here also if you put in the sequence you would get helices predicted for the sequence um, and the evidence as it says here is the prediction by TMSEC. So there's many ways to, um, to access the method. Uh, yeah and with that I'm done. Thanks a lot and if you have any questions, I'm, yeah we have lots of time left. If you have any questions feel free, if not then have fun <laughs> later today. Thank you.